Hello, I'm Julia. Welcome to the Mind Matters panel. Pam Leo once said, let's raise children who won't have to recover from their childhood. Hmm, good advice. But if we're going to do the same thing with teenagers, we're going to need a resilient strategy. To help us figure out which one to choose, I'm joined by clinical psychologist and family therapist Andrew Fuller, teacher Nerissa Rodriguez, assistant principal George Mazuris, and teacher Martin de Klerk. But of course, before we get started, let's see what the staff at Eagleton have come up with. People say a resilience program isn't a magic bullet. Well, clearly those people haven't tried Belgian fire walking. <laughs> I first saw it in a TED talk and I immediately ordered the whole kit. <laughs> you should have seen people's faces. I mean, you use the term fire pit and people immediately think of fire licence, first aid training. But in comparison to some other resilience programs, this one is absolutely easy. All you need is a three by five space and lighter fluid and a rake. They literally go from cowering in fear to racing across these flesh-eating coals like little Terminators. It's inspiring. Cameron had a little mishap in the fire pit, but he'll bounce right back, won't you, Cameron? It's all good. <laughs> what a great program. Well, it still hurts. Did those students have their feet in ice buckets? Phil's thought of everything. Where can I find his TED talk? And I hope you're enjoying my pineapple earrings. We're going to talk seriously now for a little while. Now, Belgian firewalking isn't for every school, so what programs are out there and how do you choose the right one? Love the outfit, by the way. Thanking you. It's, it's suiting you. Um, <laughs> Well, the first thing we know is that there are 40 key predictors that predict resilience and good outcomes for kids. And they can be loosely grouped into eight major areas. And so the first thing we really need to do is to sort of assess where the kids stand in terms of uh, their strengths in those areas. The first one is connectedness to adults, the strength of relationships in the school or the community. The second one is empowerment. The third one really is boundaries and expectations. Do we expect much for you? Have they got clear boundaries in the family? Then of course there's school engagement, mm. there's values, there's social skills and there's personal identity. And having obviously each school, each year level will vary in terms of which ones are strong and which ones are not quite so strong. And then it's a task really of thinking about how do we best capitalise on the strengths of our students to increase those to remedy some of the areas that are not so strong. So in answer to your question, it's not so much any specific program, it's more really identifying in that group of kids what are those strengths that I can call upon, what are those vulnerabilities I need to address and planning it from there. Mm. And often from that, basically, you start to get the answer. What are the challenges of using a bolt-on resilience program in isolation? If you go searching for a program and, and get one, it may not be catered directly to the school mm. and what you're targeting in resilience might be different. So if you get the one program, sort of a, a one-stop shop or one fixes all, it may not be targeting what you need. It but it's been working for, for you at your school. Um, it has, yeah. Uh, the challenge we had is it can't look like tokenism, so you can't just fix something by implementing a program. Mm. Um, it has to be part of the culture of the school too. And so we did a lot of work, not just the program, but also in terms of changing the language staff use. And, um, and inside the classroom. So we have um, set times for, for them doing sort of wellness stuff and resiliency stuff, but it's, I think it's the more important time and the more effective stuff is done outside when they've taken that and implemented it in other situations, whether it's in other classes or at recess or lunchtime. Or... I think getting everyone on board too, getting yep. all your staff to go with you, because if you have sections of your school not having to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't flow through right through your school. If you want your staff to be all on board and all sort of practising it in some way and building those relationships with the kids. What are the benefits of integrating a resilience program into the curriculum? I mean, the benefits are that you, you get um, benefits in the behaviour, cooperation, the atmosphere in the class, the work ethic of the students, 
and, and the students themselves, their wellbeing, which is the most important thing that you're after? I think what's valued in schools is what's measured. And so, mm. unfortunately, we live in a nation that measures literacy and numeracy and not terribly much else. I think what we really do need to do is to think about how do we measure students' resilience and wellbeing and have that as one of the clear outcomes for all schools. Mm. And, and the way to achieve that can vary. It can be a kind of continuous program, as Martin said, or other schools sort of will do it in very different ways. And I think that's fine. There's many, many ways to achieve the same outcomes. Some schools will decide we're busy as bumblebees in terms uh, one and four, so we're not going to try and add anything more because we're exhausted at that stage, but in terms two and three, we'll run a program then. Or other schools say, well, we're not going to do a program as a continuous kind of stream of sort of sessions. We'll basically run festivals. Yeah. And we'll have a festival of friendship. And we'll have a festival of ideas. Mm. And we'll have a festival of not knowing. And it's really, it's horses for courses here. It's really thinking about how do you achieve that outcome. But the best, the best resilience initiatives, it's a bit like creating a tapestry. And so it's almost like it's woven in to the very fabric of the school culture. So it affects everybody. And everyone sees that it benefits their life as well as the life of people around them. And it changes the relationships between people in that school. The festival's idea sounds great fun. I love that. But it, just because it's fun, does it mean it's actually doing anything? Are they, is it working or is it just, oh, we get this day where it's fun? But I, I think it does. And, and our program, uh, we, well, I, I found it very difficult to bring a program into our busy curriculum. So with the student programs that I've sort of led, um, I've done it in their time, lunchtime, and mm. we get together, we meet then, and then we build these um, ideas that we want to sort of promote throughout the school in, in the times when kids are out in the yard. Anyway, um, yeah. So I, I avoided the constraints of a timetable and used the off time. And it's surprising how many kids don't want to go and have their lunchtime. They, they'll come along and have a chat with you and, uh, and want to organise things. And then you can build it into free dress days, festivals, after school events, camps and all, all the other things that you can do outside of your curriculum. What does the resilience program look like at your school, Martin? Um, at the moment, it's, um, we've got sort of two levels. We've got a life skills subject and so we do the education about um, about stress and wellbeing and things like meditation and also explore um, stress relief um, activities for kids so they can try different things from circus skills to Zumba and that's the official stuff where they kind of do some surveys and stuff and work out where their resiliency is. And then uh, we also have a senior program that we've just started um, this year to target it officially because um, they don't do the life skills subject. So we've got that curriculum base but then we've got the unofficial, which is where it's become part of the culture of the school. Well, we know year 11 and year 12 are incredibly vulnerable years. We know that about 20% of students in year 12 have some suicidal thoughts during that year. So it's a wow. very, very... Is that the pressure just of year 12 yeah, that brings that yeah. on? Am I going to get the marks that I want? Am I going to get into the course that I want or the job <laughs> that I want? So it's an incredibly vulnerable time. So much so that we really have to rethink our model around well-being, particularly at years 11 and year 12. Obviously, critically, is helping parents as well as students understand how to succeed at school is important. That, that journey often begins around the middle of year 10 is often the time when schools really need to reconnect with the parents that they've lost along the way. Mm. But the other thing is to really think about how you utilise your past students as well. And so in a number of areas of Australia we've had past students who've mentored current students. But just seeing a future pathway beyond these marks that kids get so focused on is really helpful, I think. Um, people want to see results, don't they? How do you know that these programs are working? What, res what results would you expect to see, Andrew? Oh, when we, we've surveyed over 22,000 young Australians in terms of this, and you do see incremental shifts in terms of those eight key areas that I mentioned earlier uh, as schools embark upon initiatives. But beyond the, the stats, the, the thing that really shows me that it's working in a school, which might sometimes surprise you, uh, there's firstly the level of energy in the school mm. lifts. 
and so people kind of look brighter eyed. But the other real key indicator is that forgiveness creeps into a school. Forgiveness is a critical key in all of this because I suppose the, the results of those 22,000 surveys that we've done tell us that young Australians are quite good at forming relationships. What they're not very good at is when a relationship falls upon tough times, how do you patch it up? And so it's far easier to kind of do a geographical, I'm not talking to you again, you know, kind of falling out and mm. move on, mm. rather than to go, hang on, well, maybe, you know, Martin didn't really mean that, you know, maybe I need to kind of just have a chat and kind of sort it out. Is that or... cultural? Do you think that's something particularly that it happens in Australia or would it happen in other countries, do you think? I think it certainly happens around the world, but I think... Uh, Australians do have a bit of a, a cut-and-run kind of mentality. Did, yeah, I don't know. I'm genuinely... Yeah, yeah. it's very interesting. Mm. I think maybe our convict origins are part, <laughs> part of it. Uh, well, we, we often split off from our families, many, many of us, not all of us, and have come out here either as refugees or as convicts or as new, new settlers. Mm. And so it has been a kind of pioneering, individualistic kind of model. Um, another one is attendance. Attendance from staff and students. Changes. From staff. From staff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go in today. But, but you, can, you can probably vouch for this, that the, the amount of um, sort of mental health days or that yeah. staff take, you yeah. reduce with those oh, things. Hey, so you can... I think teachers should just have to do four days a week and then they have always have, they have three days off and then they'd probably be a little bit more, have the energy, because it's a big job. We've got um, our data that we get every year from uh, our students. So we go and survey them and they come back to us with... Uh, a range of responses, but one of the things that we've noticed since we've started to put a bit of time into some of our programs is that kids feel safe at our school and connected to their school. We're working on the attendance issues that you talked about, but they also have improved in, say, in the last three years. So, yeah, it, the safety for us has really improved in a space of three years, and it's, it, the kids are telling us that. We've had significant change. From 2008, we had 1,950 suspension days which is equivalent to 10 years. And in 2011, when the cafe started, we were down to 350 at the end of 2011. That's fantastic. That's phenomenal. But you also do PBIS. How does Great. PBIS work? So it's recognising positive behaviour. And for each time you are recognised for positive behaviour, you get a merit card. Or we actually use an on online modelling system where we can just tick and flick a box to say, Muhammad's done a great job today mm. and he's been a safe, respectful learner and that goes on his record. Mm. Once he gets to 10, he gets a Year Advisor Award. Mm. Once he gets to three lots of Year Advisor Awards, he goes on an excursion. So where do we find these resilience programs and where can we find the good ones, the evidence-based ones? Well, for the, for the information for our life skills subject, the resiliency stuff, I actually um, swapped what we're doing with our school with someone that I met at a PD from another school and we just exchanged our programs and, and talked about what worked and what didn't work. So you kind of, I know it sounds, the best ideas you steal from other people. So. Oh, I'm a big fan of stealing. <laughs> so, you should always steal. So we've, yeah, yeah it's stolen it's, a lot. Nothing's original, <laughs> you know, you, you steal all the time. Our, yeah. youth, our youth workers in our community have often brought ideas along and then we've sort of gone and asked other schools how they've worked with them. So you're comparing notes with local schools. Yeah, our multi-pride program is in maybe five or six schools. It started off in one school, adopted by others and... and each school's probably ran with it slightly differently. They're all student-led, but the kids pick the types of issues that are important to their school. So multi-pride in one school might be slightly different to the other, mm. except that they do meet and they talk about student issues. Andrew, can you find these things online? Yes, I mean, alongside the Beyond Blue website, obviously, I... Uh, and the Mind Matters website. And the Mind Matters website. There's also... I, I manage a couple of Facebook pages where I collect oh. ideas. Uh, one's called Resident Youth Australia, where I put up ideas that are used by schools all around the country and overseas in terms of re resilience initiatives, which have basis in, in research. And another one which I, is for teachers, which is all of the stuff on neuroscience and learning and how brains work and activities for classrooms called the learning brain. I've actually um, downloaded information about to educate students about um, sleep hygiene and stuff from Andrew's website too. Oh, so there's a lot of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we talked a lot about sleep yesterday. We yes. loved it. Yes. I got given a sleeping 
bangle, oh, good. which I don't need just quietly. There are many, many resilience mm. sort of programs and initiatives and strategies and the, the fit between the program and your school has to be pretty tight. So you've really got to think about, as George said, what's going to bring most of the people on side. You need to think about things that are going to rev up and kind of have a sense of meaning and compassion, as Martin said. It's taking something that has clearly the capacity to show you a pre-measure, not just of the problems, but also the strengths of students, and then give you the capacity to re-measure maybe 12 months down the track so you can kind of see. We know that we're not going to tackle all of the resilience issues in one 12-month period, but we want to have a different profile in a year's time than we have now. Some areas will have increased, hopefully not too many have decreased, but at the same time, what we will be tackling probably a year from today should be different than what we're tackling this year because there'll be different priorities. And that also applies at different age groups as well. So Andrew brought up, um, just reminded me that it's, it's really important to review too and mm. to keep reviewing and you can't just implement a program and go problem solved, we're done now. You, you need to keep checking back and reviewing how it's going and, and tweaking it. And the Mind Matters survey can help with that. Yeah, definitely. To finish, I'll leave you with this quote from the resilient Thomas Edison who said, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> <laughs>